Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first in our spring lecture series. Questions tonight may be submitted through the link on the STM Facebook page or through the link bit.ly slash STM lectures. Tonight, it is my pleasure to welcome Jesuit Father Gustavo Morello, Associate Professor of Sociology at Boston College. Originally from Argentina, Father Gustavo received his master's degree in social science from the Universidad Nacional de Córdoba and his PhD in social sciences from the Universidad de Buenos Aires. His research focuses on two areas within the Latin American context, the relation between religion and political violence and secularization. His most recent book, The Catholic Church and Argentina's Dirty War, uses case study methodology to examine the different positions Catholics took, including those who use faith to justify violence and those who use faith to protest the violence and were consequently kidnapped. Father Gustavo, welcome. Thank you for, uh, for having me. Thank you for organizing this. And uh, before we start, let me mention that I'm a Jesuit priest. I study theology, but uh, my expertise is in, in sociology. So uh, the, the things that we say have to do more, more with the sociology. So I realize uh, that Latin America is culturally very diverse. <laughs> I realize that Latin, Latin America is culturally cult diverse and covers a lot of land, but could you provide some high-level insights about Latin American Catholicism and what makes Pope Francis unique as a Latin American leader? Let me start um, highlighting some uh, features that, as you mentioned, I think that may help us to understand the connection between uh, Pope Francis and Latin America. Um, I think first that for Latin American Catholics, there is a sense that the church is a missionary one, that there is a responsibility to reach out to others, not to wait for, for the people to come, or, or that the parish priest should be uh, not in the rectory, but on the streets. Um, another thing that I think is important, and, and we may talk later about that, but there has been some kind of authority bestowed uh, upon religious figures, um, and that they have and they have to be responsible for that. So there is an authority, but there is a sense of responsibility for that. And the measure to evaluate their, their ability, their, their, their power, the way they exercise their authority is the closeness to the people, the, the proximity to the flock. Um, in progressive or conservative ways, but there is an expectation that the, the church authorities, the religious authorities should be closer to the people. That, uh, I think brought up the paradox because on one side um, there is an authority is is, is a clerical church, but there was never enough clergy in Latin America to run all the churches that the Catholic Church has in Latin America. So there was a lot of space for the faithful. One thing was the church in Mexico City or or in Lima in Peru, the big uh, capitals, but there is a lot of space for people to do things. Um, and because of that, there was a, a, a growing faithful autonomy, like people will have uh, empowerment and do things in the churches. And in that sense, the role of women in Latin America has, uh, pro has been prominent. I mean, it's, it's women run many churches and many things in Latin America. Uh, the diversity of Catholicism is also something interesting, um, that a, a, a vitality that have triggered to some extent also um, theological reflection in Latin America. And I think that something that uh, perhaps um, uh, summarized the, the, what I'm trying to say is that um, when we think about secularization, uh, or like the lack of, of religion or, or church state separation in, in different societies, I think it's, in Latin America, we can talk more about an enchanted modernity in the sense that there are modernity, there are things that have changed, there are... Um, differentiation of social functions, there are a room for the state, a room for the church, but also there is space for uh, religion, religiosity, or that contact with something beyond in uh, ordinary life. We, we acknowledge, or Latin Americans acknowledge, the existence of something more than ordinary in regular life. So, so unlike, unlike the United, United States, States, many assume, assume that Latin America is primarily Catholic due to the colonial history. Is this still true? And what are some of the major religious influences today? 
Catholic continent with 69% of the population identifying as Catholics. But also it's true that 30% of the people do not. So there has been a growing, uh, a, a increasing change in, in the religious landscape in Latin America. Uh, studies still portray Latin American religious feel as dynamic, heterogeneous, um, where there is a quest for transcendence that is spread all over the place. This is a vitality inclusive or also uh, inside the Catholic Church. Um, it's true that the percentage had dropped, like for 80% of Catholics what we used to have uh, 30, 40 years ago, now we have closer to 70% of Catholics. However, the amount of, of Catholic population in Latin America, like the, the absolute number of, of the population that considered Catholic has grown. The absolute number of population grown uh, bigger. For that reason, we have the diminishment in, in percentage for Catholics in Latin America, but still 70% um, more of local clergy, so priests who were born in Latin America uh, than 50 years ago. Um, at least 150,000 uh, nuns in Latin America, um, 1.5 million people uh, like catechists or, or, or uh, church lay uh, persons working in Latin America. So there is a lot of vitality among the Catholics. Pentecostalism has also transformed Latin America. Pentecostalism is perhaps the biggest, um, the first group that has challenged the hegemony of the Catholic Church when Catholicism arriving to Latin America, we have that uh, Native American religiosity and then African religiosities were assumed within Catholicism. They, they became Catholic kind of practices and, and popular Catholicism. But the Costalism is the first confession that stayed by itself, that challenged that hegemony and, and, and became a growing part of Latin American population. Today, Latin, Pentecostals, Latin American Pentecostals are, are, are solid in Latin America. They are up uh, 19, 20% of the population. Um, in Guatemala and Honduras, the highest rate of, of Pentecostals in Latin America, is they are almost 40, 41% of the population in those countries. So um, you, you can see that they are growing in Latin America. And the other group that is growing uh, very much is uh, non-affiliated, like in the United States, people who do not identify with any religious confession. However, they are not non-believers. And I think this is important to understand. Within non-affiliated that are about eight to 10% according to the countries, um, like in Uruguay or Dominican Republic, there are 37 in Uruguay, 18 in Dominican Republic, but the, the average is eight to 9%. There in that package, we have people who do not believe in God, atheist or agnostic, people who are not affiliated to a church but believe in something. Sometimes they practice by themselves or they practice with other people. And then we have people who are indifferent to the religious phenomenon. But that group that is also growing is about 10% in Latin America. So what research uh, tell us about Latin America is that there is um, more religion than there used to be before, like 50 years ago, that there is more diverse, that there are more creativity among people and religious actors in the Latin American landscape. I'm wondering, can you just talk about why there's such differences between, say, the United States and Canada and the rest of the Americas? Like for example, the, the colonial times, um, and I think that's interesting to start. I mean, I won't go back and I'll keep talking about that, but just a, a couple of you know that uh, sometimes we assume that are similar. Uh, I think that one thing that is important to notice is uh, during the colonial times, um, there were no church state separation because everything was run by the crown. So the, the, there was not such a thing as a church and a state. It was the crown with officials that were that belonged to the king, that were uh, appointed by the king, even the bishops. So there was a kind of mixture. And I think that's important to understand the role of religion in Latin America in the public sphere later. Um, and Catholicism did not provide identity. If you think with the colonies here in the East Coast and, and, and in Canada, like if you were uh, from such a, a, a religious confession for a sect, you were or from Rhode Island or Massachusetts or Quebecois or in Latin America, because everyone was Catholic, Catholicism didn't bring any sense of, of identity. There was a sense of Catholicism as an apostolic thing. The first um, priests who came to Latin America were missionary priests, Franciscans, Augustinian, Jesuits. So there was this sense of reaching out to the people who were at the margins. 
And as I mentioned, the lack of clergy in Latin America meant that sometimes masses were not mandatory in the sense that, okay, you have to go to mass, but there, there was no one to celebrate mass in the countryside. So people start to uh, develop different styles of worshiping, um, like more uh, native and Afro mixtures, like in, in Guatemala or, or Peru, if you compare them with Cuba or Brazil, where the mixture were most with Afro elements that came from the slaves. Your, uh, urban or rural differences, like one thing was, as I mentioned, Mexico City or Lima, in my city in Cordoba, in Argentina, there was a bishop in the 18th century, I think it was, that he was writing to the priest in the countryside in La Rioja, in the mountains, telling him in the 18th century, please, this is the third time I tell you that women cannot perform baptism. The point was that women were doing baptism. I mean, there was such lack of, of clergy that they were doing different things. So um, there was this sense of, of, of uh, a variety of Catholicism and people in power within uh, the church. And also um, popular people, like people of, uh, of the lower socioeconomic status and, uh, and, and upper class people mixing things with Native Americans, with Afro, with more European or Protestant styles. Uh, and religion was present in the public sphere all the time from the very beginning, even as a, as a contesting uh, the status quo, if we think of uh, Bartolomé de las Casas or Fray Montesinos in Dominican Republic, from the very beginning they were contesting the, colon the colonial power and, and, and the, the colonial enterprise in general. So it's interesting that also during colonial times there were some kind of criticism from religion towards the, the, the power. Uh, 19th century independence, whole new um, landscape. Uh, there were no more crowns, so the national states uh, started to figure out what to do with the churches. Um, they, we have a, an array of, of things in of, of, of church-state arrangement in Latin America, from an official church or an established church to a, a disestablished churches, from laicite, some different regimes that um, the national um, states were trying to figure out how to to run the church, and they have national accom different accommodations in each country and and that accommodation have changed during the time where there were more political power to less political power to the church. There were struggles. It's, I would say that the, the church state arrangement in Latin America is a balance of power at some point. It's, it's a crystallization of some power at some point that is changing or has been changing for the last 200 uh, years. One thing that is interesting in, in that time in the 19th century, early 20th century is that for the first time, the Pope has more power on Latin American churches than the king because the new republics didn't care about the king they, and they gave access to the Pope, to the church. Actually, the churches in Latin America became universal churches only, I would say at that point. Before that, they were churches of the king of Spain, the king of Portugal, but they start to report to the Pope only when the republics became independent in, in Latin America. And that struggle for um, who we are, how we, um, build our own nations, what does it mean to be a Chilean or a Venezuelan. Um, religion play a role there because Latin American countries started to mimic the European nation at some point in the 19th century, but also to wonder who, who are we, what, what our role in the world. And Catholicism was a way to pull the people together, to tie them together, say, okay, well, at least we are Catholics and we share that in common. You know, that was one of the things that I think uh, religion play a role during the, the independence times. I'm just wondering, so there's this complication between the United States, the Catholic Church, the revolutions, and much of Latin America for the 20th century. Can you just address some of that complexity? Obviously, this could be courses upon courses, but just what are some of those ties and um, how do we start to tease those out? As much as the countries were struggling, we're uh, who we are, what does it mean to be Argentinian or Brazilian, Mexican? Um, at the beginning of the 19th century or the 20th century, last, uh, last years of the 19th century, I would say that the US and, and the United Kingdom to some extent have an answer to that. They, they, those powers, those global powers were looking for colonies. So we have a kind of soft power of England in South America, Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil to some extent, where the, the United Kingdom will 
push for certain kind of political regimes that were more favorable to them, usually more conservative regimes. But also we have uh, at the same time after the Spanish-American War, um, the, the hegemony of the United States in Central America, Northern parts of, of uh, South America. If, if you look, it's funny, if you look at the, the baseball map, I mean, the, the, the places where they placed baseball was the, the American expansion. People saw Americans playing baseball and they started to play baseball. And today this kind of, of um, track of, 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 of sign that Americans were there. So the Caribbean, Central American countries, that was the, the hegemony of, of the United States. And I think it's interesting because um, in, for our um, religious discussion, because those uh, the, there were these dictators from like Somoza or, or in, in Nicaragua, Trujillo in Dominican Republic, Batista in, in, in Cuba, who were um, defenders of the US position there. But the US and the UK were also seen as um, these foreign powers, these people, the, to one extent, these dictators were trying to prevent communism, uh, but they were seen, uh, US and UK, as, as foreign powers. They were Saxons, they were white, they were Protestants. So there was this other way of, of leaders, of populist leaders in, in, in Latin America, Cárdenas in, in Mexico, uh, Vargas in Brazil, Perón in Argentina, who were trying to say, okay, we should have a nation, we should have a kind of different uh, kind of republic, we shouldn't copy Europe, we shouldn't be uh, attached to the United States, we have to have our own sense of nationality. And they use, to some extent, or they build that sense on the mixture of races, you are Brazilian, you are not uh, black or Native American or European, you are just Mexican, you are just Brazilian, you are just Argentinian. And they use the sense, in the case of Brazil, of Guatemala, of Mexico, of popular religiosity, of popular Catholicism, which was not necessarily uh, regular Catholicism, but this sense of um, Catholicism of the people, and they were the presidents of the people. So again, there was this presence of religion in the public sphere during a big part uh, of the 20th century. So you have that, but also then you get into the church aspects. What, where does the church become helpful or start to change this dialogue here? Big point there was um, the Cuban revolution. Until that point, the church was kind of associated to the regimes uh, that were there. Um, the Cuban revolution will change the idea of the political regimes. But also, um, if you keep in mind, Jen, that at that point where the Cuban revolution was taking place, the church was uh, debating about its own roots in the Second Vatican Council. Those two things will have a huge impact among Latin American Christians and Catholics in special. Uh, the Cuban Revolution showed a different political path. Second Vatican Council was something different, was trying to think where should the Catholic stand in the world. For the first time, the church um, had this kind of council of, of this uh, upgrade of, of, of the religious thought that was not condemning heresies, but saying, okay, where should we stand in this world? And one of the big things that happened in Second Vatican Council was this idea of reading the sign of the times. So Second Vatican Council was to some extent the reading the sign of the times, not only for the universal church, but basically for Europe. So the bishops who were gathered there, they said, okay, we should do this. The, the teachings from the council should be applied to each continent. And the bishops gather in Medellin, the Latin American bishops gather in Medellin in, in 1968. Medellin is a Colombian city um, that became later famous because of Escobar and the drug trafficking. You have, been, you have seen Narcos for sure. In that city, the bishops gather at that point, uh, 1968, and they started to read the, thing of the, the signs of the times in, in Latin America. And what they saw was some sense of discovering um, poverty or acknowledging the situation of poverty as a social thing, but also naming that as a sin, as, as something that uh, God didn't like, that was against God's will. That was the beginning of liberation theology. So at that point, uh, Gustavo Gutierrez, in, I think it was 1970, 1971, wrote this idea of uh, to, uh, these notes towards liberation theology. 
and he read, uh, and, and he and many people who follow him read what was going on in Latin America with theological glasses. They said it's not just a dependency, as uh, Cardoso and Faleto, two Latin American thinkers, uh, have said a couple of years earlier, but this, the, the quest is not for uh, free from dependence, but is for liberation. And, and there was a quest with biblical roots. As God has freed the people uh, of Israel in Egypt, the, he can free Latin American people from the oppression, from the structural violence, uh, from poverty in Latin America. And that um, mixture of a change within the Catholic Church that was so, so present in Latin America, and a new way of making politics that was inaugurated with the Cuban Revolution brought up these um, overlapping uh, conflicts or tension that will change Latin America in the 60s and 70s. So now, so certainly, certainly liberation li theology is widely accepted, but as you mentioned, there's some controversy with it when it first began. So what might explain some of that? And then how, how did people um, sort themselves out in different camps when it came to liberation theology versus other strains of theology and how that connected with the political systems? What uh, I just have described happened in the context of Cold War. Uh, these religious transformations uh, had a political consequences. They were read from political actors and, and, and had political consequences. On one side, uh, one side, there were revolutionary movements challenging the Latin American status quo. And many Catholics will ally with them. Many Christians will ally with them. Sometimes uh, in terms of uh, the ideal, sometimes in terms of, okay, engage with, with the fight, you know. And at the same time, there were governments that started to chase them as internal foes. That was the idea of the Cold War. The US will fight the war outside the borders of Latin America against communism national armies you have to fight the uh, will have to would, fight, would have to fight the war uh, within the latin american countries chasing communism and that was a dynamic that appeared in in uruguay in brazil in chile in argentina guatemala nicaragua el salvador peru i mean it, it spread all over the continent my take i would say that in general in that conflict in that cold war conflict in, in latin america that war between to some extent, a civil war and internal war in Latin America, um, Catholicism react, Catholics reacted to that uh, war in three different sectors. Um, one that I call committed Catholics or committed Catholicism were engaged with the transformation of the war, were working with the poor, and in some cases they joined revolutionary movement. Not all of them joined the revolutionary movement, but it's true that many of them joined um, revolutionary armies. And in many cases, there were the victims of human rights abuse. If, if we think about um, Nicaragua's uh, Sandinista revolution, when they succeed, or uh, the, the resistance of, of Guatemala and Quiche people in Guatemala um, for many years and their fight for many years, Dominicans in Brazil, for example, there was this group of priests in the early 60s or uh, late 60s, early 70s that were engage in that kind of transformation uh, and uh, request for justice in Latin America. There was another group of Catholics who will see communism and even Western democracy as hostile to God. Western democracy was too liberal for them and, and Western democracy was to blame because of the, of the emergency of, of communism. This group of Catholics thought that the church uh, needed more stronger leaders, kind of um, Franco in Spain or Salazar in Portugal. And there were, in some countries, there were like a significant number of, of, of the church hierarchy in this position. Like if we think in El Salvador before Romero, in Argentina, I would say that mo many of the bishops were in this position. Um, many sectors in Colombia were also aligned to this position. And finally, we have a third group of Catholics that I call institutional, that accepted to some extent that there was a modern world, that democracy was here to stay, that there was a liberal democracy with a republic with different institutions. So they accept the differentiation of social functions that the church cannot took the place of the state. But they did understood that the church need to have a kind of privileged uh, relationship with the political regime. Um, so sometimes to criticize it, sometimes to support it. And that was the case of, of, of Chile, of Peru, of Brazil. 
Romero, to some extent, in El Salvador, he, he started to criticize when they saw the thing, but he was not a, a, a sense of, of, of a revolutionary, like we can think about Che Guevara or Carmilo Torres. He was more like this sense of an institutional man who said, okay, there's something wrong going on here. And sometimes the same political uh, religious actors became more supportive of, of, the, of the regime, like in the case of Argentina. So, so speaking, speaking of that, that, let's go back to your home country of Argentina. How do these three different sectors of Catholics play out? Argentina politics has a, a, a kind of um, variety. So the, the political violence has been present along Argentinian history, but perhaps the 70s were the, the decade of the most violent decade in, in the history of the country. And it started with the it happened in June 1970 of a former military president. He was a dictator, General Aramburu. Um, a group of, of guerrillas kidnapped him and, and killed him. And the sur surprising thing was this group of guerrillas, when they, they, they issued a press statement, assuming that they have, uh, recognizing that they have killed him or announcing that they have killed him, he wrote down, may God have mercy of his soul. And that's kind of, uh, I highlight this because in Argentina, both sectors, so the, the state who was trying to uh, keep the status quo and the revolutionary movement rely on Catholic discourse and the Catholic imaginary. That was not the case in Uruguay or in Chile or in Brazil, for example, to name countries that were surrounding Argentina. The killing of Aramburu triggered a lot of guerrilla actions. There was instability. There was a military regime. They couldn't curb the power, so they called for election. However, they banned Perón, who uh, Juan Perón was a big populist leader in exile in those years. And, and the regime said, OK, elections, but no Perón uh, as candidate. The Peronist candidate won the, the, the election. He called for open elections, and Perón won. Uh, the election, and many people saw that with uh, hope, because the guerrillas, one of the uh, of the interest of the guerrillas was, okay, we want Peron to come back and, and have free elections. So finally, when there were free elections, people said, okay, the, the, the political violence will calm, da calm down. And it didn't happen. Like the guerrilla groups were pushing Peron to do some things. Peron uh, didn't like that. He answered with the same um, kind of measures. He, he issued paramilitary groups and, and, and started to, to do some kind of paramilitary operations against his political uh, enemies. And Perón passed away in 19, 1974. His wife, Maria Estela Martinez de Perón, was the vice president. Uh, she assumed power. She couldn't curb the, the, the violence at that point. So 1975 was like uh, everyone in, in the political spectrum in Argentina was expecting a coup d'etat. We have had many coup d'etats uh, in the 20th century. So people were expecting for the military to take charge of the country again and calm down the situation. And that happened. Um, March 1976, coup d'etat the junta took power and there was no uh, resistance in the sense of, of violence or political violence for the coup itself so it's, it's like the military just walk into the, the presidential palace and took power and nobody defended one of the most voted governments in argentinian history just to show you how um, disaccredited there were or the political system was in argentina at that point however a couple of months after the power uh, I would say October, perhaps July 1976, three or four months after they took power, people start to complain and people start to realize that uh, there were disappearances, that people just uh, disappear. Uh, that was a kind of euphemism for uh, the governmental killing of this political um, opposition. Uh, after the military coup, 1984, the, the military left the country, lost um, the ability to keep power, they called for election 1983, 1984, there was um, a, a truth commission, and the truth commission said, uh, identify that the military junta disappeared at least 10,000 people, 10,000 persons. And if you think about the Argentinian population in 1970s, 25 million in inhabitants, the toll of 10,000 victims equals per capita that of American fatalities in the Vietnam War. So the, the emotional toll for the country was similar to what happened in this country during the Vietnam War. Um, 
at that point, I think Catholics, again, how do they stand in that violence? Um, there was a, a group that, that merged with the government, that they, they, they literally merged with the government. They, they went like pre-modern in, the, in some time. I call them anti-modern because they, they assumed that the church and the government were the same thing working together. Um, they were against any negotiation with, with modernity, with, with communism, with liberal democracy. They, they were against the US, they were against uh, Russia, they, anything that was not their, their way of thinking Catholicism, which was a kind of uh, medieval idea, uh, was um, an heresy. Um, and and they, they understood that only a Catholic state will guarantee a Catholic society. For that reason, they, they supported this uh, military regime. There was another sector that did not identify with the state, that um, I, the, the ones that I call institutional in Latin America, in the case of Argentina, they did not identify with the state. They were worried about the interventions, the political interventions over the church. They didn't like this kind of identification with the church and the state, with the, the, the dictatorship and the church. However, they wanted to keep relationship. They did not want to break with the military. They wanted to keep uh, a, a good relationship with the government in order to um, fulfill this mission. So their idea was, OK, we may criticize the government in private, but we should not do that in public. I mean, this, this is something uh, that we have to support the government. Um, and I think that uh, at that point, Father Regoglio, the, the provincial of the Jesuits in Argentina, will stand at that point, like doing things in private, uh, trying to help the victims, but not challenging the government in, in public. And then we have this other group of Catholics, this third group of committed Catholics that were engaged with um, social transformations that were um, supportive of a, a transformation of the structures. Some of them, uh, as I mentioned, joined the guerrillas group in Argentina, uh, but they basically thought that if the church will have a relationship with the state, it should be to defend the human rights. Like their point was, okay, we, we should be here defending these victims of human rights, and then we will see what happened. But the state cannot torture its citizens. I would say that that was the, like the main point of this group. Pope Francis, as you know, was a young Jesuit during much of this part of Argentina's history. So how did this history influence who he was then and, and maybe how he leads now? It's important to understand that, um, uh, as, as you mentioned, Pope Francis was, was very young. And also, when, when we say the Argentinian provincial, it seems like a big position. If I ask you who is the Argentinian provincial now, you have no idea. I mean, and, and that's the point. Even after a pope, we have no idea. I know who the provincial is because he's my superior, but it's, it's not a public figure. It's not a prominent figure. It has a, a big level, but it's not that figure that one imagine now. So one thing is, is the pope being the pope. Another thing was the guy being a provincial in Argentina in those years. Um, I Again, I think that uh, he was part of this institutional group um, that were trying to keep things um, together, that it was very difficult at that point in, in Argentina. Um, I think that he learned many things from, from his experience in Argentina. I, 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 don't, I don't know him. I mean, I met him a couple of times, long, long time ago. I haven't met him and we, we never have a, 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 it's not that I am the friend and I can't tell you what he thinks. I mean, it's, it's my reading of, of, of his ideas, but I think that the sense of a missionary church is there, like the history of Latin America, the, the idea of the Catholicism for the people that, that the Catholic church should reach out uh, for the people who are outside. That sense of, of um, the image of the battlefield that he used many times, you know, like the church should be like a battlefield uh, receiving the people who are the victims, uh, the marginalized, the ones who are not powerful. I think there is something there that has to do with the Latin American roots and the service that the church did not provide in those years in Argentina. Um, I do also think that he's not naive about power, that as many Argentinian leaders know that they have power, religious leaders, I mean, knew that they have power and they have a responsibility for that. And the first responsibility is to acknowledge that you have a power to exercise and you have to be responsible for that. Um, the sense of, of, of closeness to the people, that you are not going to make a mistake if you are closer to the people. You can be more progressive, you can be more conservative, you have 
uh, more conservative strategies, but closer to the people. The, there is a distrust of the enlightened elites, the people who know what to do better, you know, um, that either from the left wing or the right wing. Um, there is a kind of, of distrust there uh, because of the contempt for the people. Um, so I, I think that there is a, a distrust of the elites that is there with, with Francis, and you can see in some of the things that, that he say. Um, perhaps this enchanted modernity that I call this idea of religion and modernity mixing together are present in Francis uh, in the sense that you can see uh, the idea of, of, of popular piety, but social justice. You can see the mixture of spirituality, but also environmental science. Um, and this sense um, that the church should not be an NGO, neither a Renaissance Curia, you know, neither a, a Renaissance court. Uh, the, the sense that um, the church is just for an elite, you know, or, or something too broad that is not religious or, or too small that is just for an elite. I think those are the things that... Uh, are at odds, perhaps, with, with, with Latin American Catholicism. And I, I can see that in, in, in Francis, um, in, in some of his gestures and of the things that he, he does. Um, but let's, um, if I mean, let's stop here and let open the floor for the people to, to ask questions. Thank you so much, Father Gustavo. I think it's just really important to hear um, how much culture shapes people, right? So we all are shaped within a culture and to understand more about Argentina's cultures to understand more about the leader of the church now. Uh, to our audience, please do send in questions. I do have a few questions for you just to get us started. So your work is very specific to Argentina, but you also connect it to other parts of Latin America, and this is clear with the connected history as well. You can't do all of this sociological research on your own. So do you engage with other sociologists? What's that like? And especially coming from different parts of the world. Um, in the last year since I came to the United States, uh, I've been working with colleagues in, in, in Cordoba, in Argentina, where I was from, in, in Montevideo, in Uruguay, in Lima, in Peru, um, in Spain. Now I'm trying to uh, put together a project with people in, in these countries, but also in, in Chile, in Brazil. <clears throat> I think it's, it's very important to have... Um, local researchers, uh, because I, I do think there is a, a, an excellent quality of scholars in Latin America that sometimes they do not have the resources, uh, the, the economic resources, but also the, the opportunities to be exposed to, um, to Yale, for example, that I have, this advantage that I have. Um, sometimes they don't have the, the, like the window to, 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 to show what they are doing. So I'm trying to put together those, those teams. Um, but also because I think, as you mentioned, we are shaped by our context. And I think that the, the researcher who is involved in the context, she will be much more aware of what's going on in, in Rio de Janeiro or, or, or in Colombia than someone coming from outside trying to figure out what happened. So I think that having the, the eyes of people on the field, people who understand the culture, um, it's very important. And because we are together, we are working together, I think we are able to to see our own biases and to realize that, okay, that, that may be just a mistake or, so we can check because we are like from many different pieces, it's like a puzzle that they're trying to put together. And if it doesn't fit, there's something that we have to keep thinking about that. No, I think it's, uh, that's a thrilling part of the research uh, that just working with other people, even with other colleagues here in the States, it's, it's uh, something that I, I, I value very much. We have a couple of questions that came in about the relationship between Pentecostalism and Catholicism. And so as Pentecostalism is a large influence, has this also influenced the Catholic Church? And is it influencing Catholicism socially and theologically? Also, is the church losing ground to Catholicism? And what's happening in Paraguay? Also Catholic countries in Latin America, there is just, uh, I would say, I think it's three or two percent of people who consider themselves Pentecostals. Usually in Latin America, I keep talking about Pentecostal. If you see a survey, they will say Protestants because they put within that uh, category of Protestant, mainline Protestant, Evangelicals, no Evangelicals, Pentecostals. My take is that usually when we are talking about the, the, the growth in Latin America, we are talking about Pentecostals and perhaps some neo-evangelicals. Um, so I keep talking about Pentecostal because of that. 
in Paraguay, I would say is 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 um, there is a presence uh, of, of Pentecostal, but it's, it's lower compared with Brazil, for example, border, border in Paraguay with 20%, 25% of, of, of the people evangelical. So Paraguay has a smaller group of evangel evangelical, it's much more, it's a Catholic country. And I would say Paraguay is, is a, a kind of popular Catholicism, very embedded in, in, in the Paraguayan culture. Um, Pentecostalism is influencing Latin America uh, and Latin American Catholic Church in, in, in different ways. At the beginning, I would say the Catholic Church was very reluctant to uh, Pentecostals and uh, we will call them within the Catholic Church Pentecostal sects that were invading Latin America, supported by the United States. And that was 60s, 70s. Now, interestingly enough, um, Catholics and Pentecostals are aligned in different uh, topics. In the years that we were talking uh, about the, the violation of human rights, uh, in most Catholic cant in most countries in Latin America, the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches became supporters of human rights. That was the case in Chile, for example, or in Brazil. Same case in Argentina. While in Chile and Brazil, the Catholic Church was supported by the Protestant groups, in Argentina was the Protestant groups who started to mobilize around human rights and some Catholics supported them. Now, there's still an alliance, but it's more on the other side. So uh, people who are more conservative uh, from the Catholic Church and the Protestant sectors are aligned together, are demonstrating, uh, demonstrating uh, on the street together, complaining about um, sex um, rights or, or the expansion of, of, of gender issues, you know, like the expansion of the state trying to, um, um, for, the, for the same sex marriage or, or um, sexual right uh, issues. We have this alliance, this political alliance from um, Pentecostals and Catholics together. On the political realm, on the religious realm, we have charismatic uh, renovation, so in, in the, the charismatic renewal. So in many countries or in many churches in Latin America, there are a style of worshiping that became more evangelical. I mean, like the sense of clapping or, or the singing or raising hands. There was uh, this a kind of piety that has inspired many Catholics and the emphasis on the Holy Spirit, I think that that's come in Latin America has came lately because of the Pentecostal influence. You know? So it's a kind of interesting dynamic and I will say it's, it's a very located dynamic. I'm talking in general and, 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 and my, my conscience is biting me because, okay, but I know cases when it's different. So I would say it's something that you have to look on the ground and not even in the country, but in the city or in the neighborhood. For example, in, with this team that I mentioned, we did a lot of interviews in different cities in Latin America. Sometimes the only institution in the poor neighborhoods in Latin America fighting against the drug dealing or the drug problems were Pentecostal pastors and Catholic nuns, supported by the state. So the, the money for the programs came from, from the state, but the ones who were on the field were uh, Catholics and Pentecostal leaders working for the people there. So it's a kind of interesting mixture uh, of uh, Pentecostals and, and, and Catholics in, in, in Latin America. So topics like the different um, different church denominations or the different ways that people might approach church and state are easy, but your actual research is pretty difficult, looking at violence, kidnapping, violent violations of human rights. Um, this has to just weigh on you at some point. So what do you do in your free time? How do you take a break from this? How do you let go of the difficult research topics and um, when I was interviewing the victims in, in Latin America, I did my research on a group of seminarians and, and a priests, an American priest who were kidnapped, uh, and I could interview them. And the, the, the whole process of interviewing them was, was demanding. Um, and it was interesting because I, I always and perhaps it's uh, the disclosure that I may hear, you know, okay, I'm a priest, but I'm doing sociology. So when I interview these people, these people say, okay, I'm a priest, but I'm doing this from a sociological degree, I'm pursuing a PhD. Um, so I, I was trying to position myself as a sociologist, uh, talking to them. But during the interviews, I realized that I was the first official of the church, the first 
authority, if you want, I was just a priest, but the first one from the church who asked them what happened. And I think there was a kind of, uh, of opportunity, of, of, of reconciliation, of, of being able to talk for the first time that, that uh, was, was very moving, um, was demanding too, but, but there was a healing process uh, there that, that was very impressive. I think one of the things I do, I did was um, trying to, so the, my book in English is an academic book uh, from Oxford University Press and I follow all the standards and it was the book that gave me tenure here in the States. But in Argentina, I, I modified the book to make it a book that will be readable for more people. You know, I, I said, okay, this is a story that more people should know. And, and it's something that I, um, we should be able to talk about this uh, in a different way. So I, 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 that was one way of, of, of dealing with that. You know? um, I, I also changed my topic. Um, there was a point that I said, okay, that was too much. And, and now I'm working more. I interviewing people again, but I'm asking more about the religious practice today. So I kind of switch uh, from those years to what are the people doing now when they, when they practice religion? You know, what, what are the things that people do when they do religion? Uh, in Latin America. So I'm switching kind of um, at that point a, a little. Um, and I guess that perhaps the toll that, that was there was something that moved me um, away. I, I, I am, I'm happy I did that research and I work on that. And it's a topic that is still very, very there to me. And, 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 and I, I enjoy talking about that. Um, but also it's something that um, yeah, it, 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 it's, 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 a, it's a difficult topic, you know, to sometimes to, to explore. You mentioned adaptation. I think that's, I mean, really important, right, in terms of research and being able to listen to people and change your approaches as needed, uh, but also being able to find out what you need. How has that been in terms of the teaching side of things during this pandemic? We've all had to make major adaptations. Why I'm talking to you on Zoom instead of having you here with our friends all sitting here in the room, but uh, wh what have you done to change in terms of your own teaching? And I, I, I hope we can meet in person at some point. I mean, I'm not that far from, from New Heaven, so uh, once we are end with the pandemic, we can have the meeting in person. But um, yes, I think um, I, I, I have to adapt more to the students. Uh, we are teaching a um, hybrid uh, way, so we have some students in the classroom, some students uh, remotely. Um, I've been trying to be more open to change. Like sometimes I'm, I'm planning things and things uh, do not work uh, as I plan. Um, many of the interaction that I would enjoy with the students, like the small groups or the chat or walking around the classroom is like, I, I am tired, you know, like I just cannot move around the classroom. Uh, and that has been a, a, a big thing, a big difference. Um, and I would say mostly paying attention to uh, what the students are, are, are feeling or reading or interested in them. Sometimes, um, I don't know if you have this sense that uh, you, you bring something to the classroom and you can read the audience. Uh, there is a way that, that you can feel the, the tension or not in the classroom. And, and, and remotely, it's more difficult to do that. No, it's, 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 it's a problem. So uh, I'm more open to the, the feedback, just trying to follow up um, uh, takeaways and, and, and yeah, many different technologies that I, I'm learning to use with, with, this, with this thing. And for sure, I mean, I'm a 54 year old man, so uh, the students are much more, more savvier than myself in this term. So I, I'm just asking, uh, most of the time I'm asking what, what things are working or if they have a new strategy. So I'm incorporating some things uh, because of the student recommendation for the class, yes. So coming from a place that's a little warmer, and um, I heard from one of your fellow Jesuits that you're uh, gr that you're really good at uh, grilling Brazilian steak. So first of all, what are your secrets, and are you willing to share those? And what kinds of Argentinian food should we all try? Uh, yeah. Uh, so it's um, no, we do Brazil is very similar, but this like, we have this this uh, tension with Brazil, like in soccer about the grill. Um, but here in Boston, I, I I don't get Argentinian cuts, so I have to go for the Brazilian ones. But uh, it's patience. It's just the the beef on the grill and, and patience. It's just salt. It's it's, it's uh, 
there's something about the fire in the culture when you put the fire and people uh, started to, to surround, to, to stand around the fire. And I think the grilling has something like that. And it's even in the American culture, you have that in the summertime. Uh, so, but I, I, I do this um, um, tri tip, which is a Colonian, a, a Californian cut that Brazilians have, and we have in Argentina. It's called picanha. Sometimes the, the beef ribs also on the grill. So, yeah, those are my my expertise in, in this part of the world when it's summer. Now you cannot go outside because it's, the grill is covered with snow. So, no, no grilling for until, I like, guess, April. Well, thank you, Father Gustavo. I, this has just been a delight, and uh, I really do hope that we are able to meet at some time in the near future uh, when the pandemic's over, and certainly would welcome you down to Yale. would love to have you here. Uh, to our audience, I invite you to join us again next Sunday at 6 p.m. as Sharon Kugler, the chaplain at Yale, talks about her life as a scholar and believer for the Catholic Faculty Series. Thank you, everyone, and have a good night.